Hi, I'm Shelley Fold Nasso, CEO of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, and I'm here with Haley Smoot, our Director of Public Policy, to share with you some background information about the Comprehensive Cancer Survivorship Act. So some background information, this bipartisan legislation was introduced first in December of 2022 by Representatives Debbie Wasserman Schultz um, from Florida, Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania, and Mark DeSaulnier from California. It was also introduced in the Senate by Senators Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota and Ben Cardin from Maryland. So we will be seeking additional co-sponsors in the House, and we're looking for a Senate Republican to lead and introduce the bill in the Senate. So what does the cancer, Comprehensive Cancer Survivorship Act do? So it addresses the health of cancer survivors throughout the entire continuum of care, from diagnosis through active treatment and post-treatment survivorship. And this is really important because as you probably know, um, NCCS really coined the term survivor for cancer survivors and the, de the definition of survivors as from the moment of diagnosis. So just some background, we've been working with Congresswoman Washington Schultz on this legislation for a long time, and we're very excited to have it introduced in 2022. We've probably been working on it for five years or more. And we did a lot of work to educate all of the members of Congress involved in this, that this has to be about survivors from the beginning and not just in the post-treatment uh, phase. It, and all of the work that we do at NCCS is about the quality of cancer care from diagnosis, through treatment, and through post-treatment survivorship. So this bill includes provisions to close the gaps that cancer survivors face to improve survivorship care, treatment, and then that transition for all cancer survivors. So what's in the bill? There's a number of different provisions. So we're, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them and then we're gonna go into detail on three of the provisions. This is a comprehensive bill and it, it has way more than you as an, an advocate should be expected to understand. So what we're going to do is focus on three provisions that we think are really important and that will be something where your background will really add to the understanding of why it's an important provision. Um, but we're not going to expect you to know or understand or talk about all of these. And again, when you go into meetings with your members of Congress, they don't expect you to be the expert on the entire bill. They want to know how your story and how it relates to the data and how it relates to the need for cancer survivors. So in our other video on the, the worksheet, we talk about how you take your story and, and relate it to um, the need for this bill overall. You don't have to know all these details and you can say, I don't know if you're asked about something. So so we're going to just give you high level what's in it and then talk more detail about three provisions. So one of the provisions is cancer care planning and communication, and I'm going to talk in more detail about that. Um, also survivor education and resource tools. So information for survivors and caregivers and, and healthcare professionals to be able to share resources to help with that transition. There is an alternative payment model. We know that how we pay for care, cancer care and any health care really affects how it's delivered. Um, the CMS or uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that um, oversees the Medicare program has tested a, a payment model for oncology care really focused around um, chemotherapy administration. They have a new payment model that starts in July this year about, um, again, that ongoing cancer care for people currently in treatment. They have not had a payment model that's about survivorship care. And our belief is that by incentivizing better survivorship care that coordinates among the different professionals that are involved in survivorship care, we'll have better care. So that's what this provision would do. It also includes um, some a provision about navigation for survivors to really help um, review the survivor navigation programs that are out there and, and determine how they can be, best be developed across the continuum. Most navigation really focuses on getting people from a, a screening to diagnosis to treatment, but doesn't really focus on helping people who've completed treatment. It also includes a provision for survivorship, a, a survivorship care demonstration program, and this would be a grant program to evaluate various survivorship care strategies to improve the quality of cancer survivorship care. Uh, it includes some assistance with employment, and Haley's going to talk to you more about that, so I'm going to wait to let her tell you about that, as well as an adult cancer survivorship study that she's going to talk about. It also includes some important supports for childhood cancer survivors. It asks um, the Health and Human Services to convene a group of stakeholders recommending childhood and adolescent cancer survivors to develop best practices for states to ease that transition of child and adolescent survivors from active treatment to primary care. 
and ensure the development of survivorship care plans for these survivors. And then finally, it includes a provision for fertility preservation services for Medicare beneficiaries. And, um, and so that would ensure that Medicaid, Medicaid covers fertility preservation services for cancer, cancer patients who receive treatment that may lead to infertility. So first, I'm going to talk about cancer care planning and communications. For those of you who have been active with NCCS in the past and been a part of our Hill Days, either in person or virtually, you've talked about this bill before, this provision before. This is the same uh, cancer care planning service that was included in the bill that Congressman DeSaulnier, a separate standalone bill that Congressman DeSaulnier and Buddy Carter had introduced in previous Congresses. And again, Dr. Uh, Congressman DeSaulnier is, is a cancer survivor and is a champion for this bill as well. It would create a Medicare service and payment for care planning and coordination services to help improve the coordination of care and transition to primary care. So this, di this diagram shows sort of the complexities of cancer care coordination and of course the patients at the center. And generally it falls to the patient to be the one coordinating care among these different providers. We believe and have always believed and advocated for the cancer care planning as a way to help facilitate that communication. If you as the survivor has a cancer care plan that outlines your treatment, your potential side effects, the need for surveillance, uh, what kinds of tests you need to have as follow-up care, what kinds of side effects you may expect and what needs to be done to address those side effects, then you can share that with all the different providers that are part of your care. In our 2020 survey, uh, State of Cancer Survivorship Survey, we asked if you'd received a cancer a, a, a care plan, and only 17% of survivors said they had received it. Um, so without a written plan, survivors are left to navigate their cancer diagnosis without clear direction. And so we believe that the, the cancer care plan will help patients by giving them this tangible plan or roadmap, and it'll promote shared decision-making with patients and their cancer care team so that patients are not left in the dark, and will empower patients with the information they need to help manage and coordinate their care. When we survey uh, survivors in our state of survivorship survey, the majority say they discuss what to expect post treatment with their provider, but they got, but only that's 62%, but far fewer got information about exercise and nutrition, long term side effects, or mental health support. And only 17% said they got a post treatment plan. We know through our survey that some of these, uh, that exercise, nutrition, side effects are key concerns. For survivors, but they're not getting the information that they need to really manage their own care. And then the burden falls to the survivor to really figure it out. And so that's why we have long advocated for cancer care planning. And we're excited that that's part of this more comprehensive bill that includes other provisions to help survivors as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to Haley to talk about two of the other provisions in the bill. Thank you, Shelley. Um, awesome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about employment assistance and the adult cancer survivorship study. Okay. So um, the employment assistance provision is also um, an incredibly important part of this, this legislation. It really provides education and assistance to survivors, as well as their families and caregivers who are experiencing barriers to employment because of a cancer diagnosis. The types of assistance that they could receive as part of this program include transportation, child care, nutritional, physical activity, psychosocial, and financial assistance. They can also receive career and training services to help them reenter the workforce. So this would apply to survivors who remain employed during treatment, um, those who have to reduce their working hours while they're receiving treatment, and anyone re-entering employment after treatment as well. Um, that also includes their families and caregivers, because we know that a lot of survivors sometimes have to leave the workforce, have to leave their jobs so that they can um, to really focus on their treatment and, and trying to um, manage all the effects that they feel. So this kind of helps them by providing that targeted assistance to re-enter the workforce and, and get back to their jobs. And so just a, a little bit more information about the benefits of, of this provision. Um, as we all know really well, many survivors experience financial toxicity because of you know, either the lost wages um, or out-of-pocket costs uh, that are associated with either parking, traveling for doctor appointments, even if you, you know, don't handle, um, you, know, you have a negative re reaction to treatment, et cetera. So, 
Um, you know, a lot of survivors do experience those financial sacrifices. And that's also, um, we also saw that in our survey. So you can see just a little image here that nearly half of survivors um, reported that they had to, ex that they experienced financial sacrifices. And there are certain groups that are more impacted, like young adults, 76% of, of young adults did say that they experienced financial sacrifices. 74% of individuals with metastatic cancer, 69% of Hispanic individuals, and then 63% of Black survivors said that they experienced financial sacrifices. So we've seen in research that survivors have higher patient time costs. So that's time spent receiving care, which they could be using for other purposes. So they have higher uh, patient time costs than people without a cancer history. So we believe that this targeted assistance can really help survivors who are uh, facing employment challenges. Um, it, it allows them to, or helps them remain employed and financially stable. And then the next provision, final provision that we'll talk to you about today is um, the adult cancer survivorship study. So this provision in this bill requires an analysis to assess the benefits of creating an adult version of the already existing childhood cancer survivor study. So this study, the purpose of it is really to collect information about late and long-term effects of cancer so that we can better understand the effects that survivors experience and improve treatments and interventions in order to increase survival, minimize the harmful health effects that survivors experience and improve their quality of life. So again, the benefits of, of this provision um, and the need for it, just to give a little bit of background, um, survivors are at risk of developing future health problems. And I think many people know that and have experienced that themselves uh, because of their cancer treatment. And sometimes this can occur even decades after completing treatment. Um, we saw again a clip from our um, from our from our recent uh, survey. We see that a majority of survivors are still experiencing symptoms today. So that's seventy four percent of individuals who were diagnosed three to five years ago, sixty nine percent diagnosed six to ten years ago, and then fifty eight percent of those uh, survivors diagnosed over ten years ago are still experiencing symptoms. So it's really important to really track that. So, um, you know, we're getting additional data and insights to better help survivors and healthcare providers make informed decisions about their care. It would also help ensure future survivors have access to the best possible care. So then um, just to give a little bit of uh, an idea of what to expect in your meeting, we've covered this in, a, in another um, video that we did as well on Hill Meetings 101, but this is more focus specifically on the legislation. So I'll just kind of walk you through what a typical meeting like meeting looks like and kind of what to expect. So first, um, kick off the meeting that you're in on the Hill with, um, with just brief introductions, share your name, your city, uh, your connection to cancer, and make sure you tell them you're an NCCS advocate. And if you are a constituent, um, do confirm that you are um, the constitu a constituent of your member of Congress. Um, whose office you're meeting with. Then, of course, state the purpose of the meeting. So in this situation, you're sharing that you are advocating for the Comprehensive Cancer Survivorship Act. Um, share your story, which is incredibly important since you are the expert in your story. Uh, you know your story, you know your personal experience, you are the expert, so please do share that. And then finally, make the ask. Um, so this year, at as you know, things change, but at this point, and we'll, we'll let you know if the ask changes, but we're expecting for your house meetings um, to, when you meet with members of Congress or their staff, ask them, will you co-sponsor the Comprehensive Cancer Survivorship Act? If you're meeting with senators um, or Senate staff, ask them if they'll co-sponsor the legislation once it's introduced in the Senate. So at this time, we're expecting that um, the House side will introduce this legislation, and then the Senate, they're still looking for a Republican to be the co-lead for the legislation, so it may be introduced at a later date. But don't worry, we will let you know the day before Hill meetings um, what the exact ask is. But at, the time, at this moment, this is what we're expecting it to be. <clears throat> so um, just a tip, too, if you are talking to a Republican office, um, since this bill is bipartisan, be sure to lead um, when you talk about who's introduced to the legislation, be sure to lead with the Republicans. So in this case, you would say 
the legislation, the Comprehensive Cancer Survivorship Act was uh, introduced by Representative Fitzpatrick, who's a Republican from Pennsylvania, and then Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz from, from, uh, from Florida. Um, and then also, most importantly, do you remember that in your meeting, like you don't need to be an expert on the bill or be able to answer every single question about the bill. What's really important and where you are an expert is sharing your story. No one knows your story better than you do. Um, we just, you know, as Shelly mentioned, we just want to make sure that you know enough about the bill so you can tie it to your story. But don't be afraid to say, I don't know. But let them know you can get the answer uh, for them. Just be sure to capture any questions, pass them along to an NCCS staff member so we can follow up with the office and provide that additional information if they needed it. And just to give a quick example, because I know last year we had um, a meeting with one office who got really in the weeds, but I was with um, a CPAP member and, um, and I was there. It was just the two of us with the staff member and they kind of went into the weeds about certain billing codes and had specific questions. Um, but they asked me that they, they didn't expect, you know, that the CPAP member to know those really like in the weeds questions. And so typically members or staff or you know, members of Congress or their staff will know, I'm not going to ask, you know, CPAP members like really expensive or really in the weeds, like extensive um, questions. Um, they really want to hear your story. So if you get any crazy questions, do, like I said, let us know. But typically you shouldn't be asked, uh, be expected to know that level of detail. And then just quickly, um, after your meeting, some things to keep in mind, some things to do. Be sure to tweet to thank your legislator for meeting um, with you and restate the ask that you shared in the meeting. Send thank you emails with responses to any outstanding questions that the member or the staff may have had. Like I said, follow up with the Hill, the Hill staff and NCCS staff on any action items if there were any in your meeting. And if your meeting, if your member does take action, be sure to thank them and their staff. You could do that quickly by just tweeting them and thanking them for their support. And then finally, I'll just kind of walk you through some things to um, that you should be seeing or hearing about soon. Um, just kind of next steps, what to expect. So this year we are working with Soapbox Consulting to schedule Hill meetings for everyone who's attending this year's in-person CPAT symposium. We'll have a little bit of information um, in the, the email for you that will be sent out. And then you'll be hearing directly from Soapbox Consulting about your schedule um, for your meetings and, and kind of what to expect. And they'll provide a handy map and, and schedule for your meetings. Um, also, just to let you know, NCC, NCCS staff may join you for some of your meetings if we can. Um, so don't be surprised if you see one of us in there. We will attend a few of them, um, as many as we can. And then also uh, just to let you know that most advocates will be paired with other advocates in different districts or states. Um, for example, say Bethany from New Hampshire has been paired with Kathy from Vermont because they're the only advocates attending from their states and we wanna be sure everyone has a buddy so they're not in meetings alone, it makes it more fun. So if you're in a group with advocates from different districts or states, just you know, kind of let the advocate who's the member's constituent really kind of take the lead in the meeting and, and make that ask since they are their constituent. Of course, you can still um, speak, of course, and, and share your story, but um, kind of let the, the member's constituent kind of take the lead in that meeting. So you'll receive a preliminary schedule the week before the symposium, but um, the schedule won't be final until the day before your meetings. You'll receive that final schedule the night before um, Hill Day during our Hill Day prep session. Um, also, we have a virtual Q&A session scheduled for June 14th from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. So be sure to pop by if you have any questions. That's your next opportunity to kind of ask some questions that you have about the bill or logistics or anything related to the Hill Day. Um, as I mentioned, you can also ask questions during the Hill Day prep session on June 21st. So that's the day before um, the Hill Day. And then just remember that NCCS is here to help. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, uh, attend the Q&A, ask your questions before, uh, during the Hill Day prep session on June 21st. And like I said, you can reach out to us too. We're happy to help. Um, and these videos are really helpful too. So 
Um, also, finally, be sure to check out the Hill Meetings 101 presentation for more information about what you can expect in your Hill Meetings, including do's and don'ts for meetings, how the meetings are structured, what to do after a meeting, like tweeting your legislator, sending a thank you email, which we kind of addressed here. And then, of course, how to stay involved whenever you, you go home. Um, and then we have the other video. Be sure to um, what the... Be sure to check out the short, it's very, very short, Telling Your Story presentation. It walks you through how to use the worksheet, the Telling Your Story worksheet, um, so that you can hone your story for held meetings. Since you don't have much time in these meetings and will be paired with other advocates, it's best to keep your story at about two minutes. So of course, if you have any questions, um, be sure to reach out. Here's my email address. We're happy to help you in any way. So thank you so much for watching this video. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions.